Hello and welcome to Ion Oakland. I'm Chuck Moss, your host, and we have a great show today. Got a great guest, Chris Williams. He's a planner for the Southeastern Michigan Council of Governments, or SIMCOG, and the Regional Transportation Plan Coordinator. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you. Now, let's real quick, what, what is SIMCOG? <laughs> That's always a, it's a great question. Um, we get that a lot. Um, but SIMCOG, or the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Southeast Michigan. Uh, well, what does that mean? Um, what that means is for every region over a certain population, uh, they're federally or mandated to have an organization or body to plan the transportation services or system um, for that region. So for Southeast Michigan's uh, region, we are that designated agency. Now, just uh, you know, kind of clarify, SEMCOG itself is sort of like the United Nations for Southeast Michigan local governments. Uh, you know, uh, Detroit and Birmingham and Wyandotte, and I think uh, uh, out to Ann Arbor, down to Monroe, and up to Port Huron are all members. And uh, so as uh, sort of a subset of that, one of its functions is to be the designated, as you said, Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is a, a sort of a federal uh, designation to get money. Uh, so what is, what? Do you, how did you get to do this? What's your background? Sure. Um, I am, a, I'm a lifelong planner. So I went to, went to graduate school for planning. Um, initially, um, prior to coming to SimCog, I was a transportation planner in the uh, Dallas metro area, um, doing some similar things um, uh, with, with transportation planning. But uh, I'd always had an interest in just kind of how, like, how do we get from A to B? So, and just kind of beyond, we take a car, we take a bus, we ride a bike, we walk, but really how are those systems built, how are those um, systems uh, are created and planned. And so I really had an interest in that. And, you know, I found out um, one day that there was a, it was a career. And so I went to grad school and, and, you know, 15 years later, the rest is history. Yeah. You found you can actually get paid for it, which is not bad. Uh, you know, I believe me, I understand yeah. how that works. So uh, now let's talk about regional transportation plan. What exactly is that? So the regional transportation plan is essentially the main product that we develop at SimCog on the transportation side. Um, it is a just kind of a sort of amalgamation of all the transportation plans um, for all the different modes that we that we put together. Um, and we come up with this plan, which will be, you know, I like to think of it as the blueprint for how transportation investments are um, prioritized in the region um, for Southeast Michigan. Um, we typically create a plan that will go out 25 years. Um, it takes a long time to plan a transportation system. Things really don't happen overnight, right? So this plan is really looking towards the future, what the transportation system will look like in, in Southeast Michigan. So now uh, I, I know you have to come up with one every, you know, what is it 10 years or you know, uh, are you updated? I think it's every four years. So it's, 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 it's continuing being updated um, every four years. And so according to that plan, then that's how you decide all the grants and um, federal money and everything comes in and SEMCOD kind of figures out where a lot of it goes. So now I'm going to ask you a question. So what all is this? Is this like a brand new plan or just the routine up, uh, updating or what what's going on? Sure. sure. So um, for each iteration or each cycle of the, the RTP, we kind of use the previous version as a basis um, because, you know, while transportation um, does take a while to actually build out and implement, you know, it takes, it takes a while to, to build a highway or a road or to, to, to develop a transit system. Um, the idea is that when we update the plan every four years, it's, it's, it's building on the previous plan, but it's also incorporating all of the new um, present current conditions uh, of the transportation system, whether it's um, population, whether it's like technologies that are available, 
things that that are just kind of coming to the forefront um, as far as transportation services are involved. So it's it's it, it's not an update or it's not a very brand new plan every time, but we do go with go into it thinking um, what are some ways that we can kind of build upon what we've uh, done before and with an eye towards the future. Well, here's now here's the deal. Um, you know, in Southeast Michigan, you know, Metro Detroit, it's basically been the same for, you know, since what, 1970, 1960. You have this, you have the, you know, you would have Detroit City uh, and then you would have the metro area. So you have that, you know, that, that dynamic going on and that more people driving cars and the commuting patterns and it, more expansion into the metro area. You know, it, it was basically stable. But now in the last, geez, 15 years or so, uh, Detroit has truly, truly had a renaissance. It's finally had its renaissance. It's coming back. You've got it uh, uh, really, you know, I want to say, uh, reborn. So that dynamic is changing. But more importantly, but post-COVID, you have a lot of people working from home now. Uh, are you seeing the same need for commuters, for people driving back and forth? Is it like a whole different world now, or or is it essentially reverted to the same? So, that, no, that's a great question. I think, um, if you were to ask me this uh, a year ago, or maybe even two years ago, I would say that, hey, you know, Coast shown that the paradigm is shifting and things are changing. and and we need to accommodate, um, you know, have better accommodation for work from home, which you know kind of has implications on on the the transportation system, right? But what what types of services are needed? What type of capacity is needed? Uh, we noticed that uh, we did a lot of digging into the data of kind of what was actually happening during the, the COVID period, right? We had the stay at home orders. We had a lot of employers. Um, where they were possible to work from home models. Um, you know, we had children uh, uh, with with schooling from home, and so that really kind of presented a lot of challenges in in in, in what uh, transportation needs were 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 needed. Um, however, we have again we've been continually looking at the data, and what we are seeing is that while Commuting patterns have not completely returned to what they were prior to the pandemic. What we're thinking of is like 2019. Um, it have by and large gone back, you know, a significant um, amount. Um, one thing that we were tracking during the COVID period, like right at the height, was um, uh, when you think of like peak periods or when you think of like traffic times. You know, you expect to have morning traffic, right, as everybody's going to work. Um, and then the roads were a little bit clear during the day while people were working. And then in the afternoon, in the early evening, people are back on the road and, and things are, 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 you know, quote unquote congested or there more, there's more traffic on the road. But what we were seeing over COVID is that that kind of peak period where you can kind of count on it being uh, more traffic in the morning and the afternoons really didn't exist. And it was more of a, 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 a a steady stream of traffic throughout the day for those who were even on the roads. And so we experienced that for a number of years. So, you know, probably two years, but then, you know, over the past year and year and a half or so, uh, we've noticed that those peak periods are returning and kind of more traditional commuting patterns are, are returning. Um, that isn't to say that it is at the same magnitude as it was prior to the pandemic, because it's not, because again, more people are, you know, commute from or work from home or they have, um, you know, we, we call them non-traditional work schedules, you know, maybe 10 hours a day for four days and off a day, you know, things like that. But uh, by and large, the, those similar commuter patterns are returning. So basically now what, it's kind of reverting, reverting slowly but surely to the tradition. Uh, one thing that's different for, for, you know, years and years and maybe the peak out would be 15, 20 years ago, is that you had, I mean, let's be honest, you had a, you know, very devastated, depopulated uh, Detroit. You had a, a burgeoning suburban area. Uh, although I know if you could fair to call it suburban, it's as urban as anything. Uh, now right. Detroit has serious, is the comeback of Detroit is without, you know, without a doubt, well established now. It's wonderful to see. Is the resurgence of Detroit as a destination, as an employment center, as a residential center, changed commuting patterns particularly? 
Um, I would say that it has. Um, we're a little bit more kind of migration or, or influx into the into city uh, of Detroit. Um, now, the magnitude of that, um, we, we kind of had like a peak for that type of travel around 2001. And then, you know, what happened in the subsequent years. And then um, over the past, you know, we were on an tr upward trajectory for a few years until the pandemic hit. And now, you know, we're kind of building ourselves back up from 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 that region and in, in, in Detroit in particular. Um, and we anticipate that um, that type of growth will continue to where we'll hit the 2001 peak um, in a few years around like 2026 or 27. And then it will continue to to grow from there. And so, you know, not not just population, but employment. Um, the labor force and things like this. So we anticipate, um, you know, a, a lot more uh, uh, the commuting into Detroit for for work. I mean, there are a lot of, um, you know, good initiatives, great initiatives, a lot of uh, employment, um, uh, industry being relocated and, and burgeoning Detroit. So, yeah, those are some things that we are seeing and, and we anticipate that that will continue. Well, you know, I've I've seen, I've, I real. I never, I'll be honest, I never thought I'd see Detroit come back in my lifetime, certainly to the extent it has. And it's, you know, it's wonderful. I, uh, you know, even though it is, it is hard to get a parking space downtown again, but that's fine. That's, that's a, that's a problem of success. Um, I would, uh, you know, Little Caesars Arena looks great. I would prefer to see a Stanley Cup mm -hmm. in it, but uh, well, you yeah. know, uh, give it time. Uh, Maybe. So, Oh, yeah, I don't know about the, well, maybe not this year, but one one can never tell. Uh, before you know, I want to we're gonna run out of time in this segment, but I just want to say, do you guys talk to other parts of Simcog when you start looking at, for instance, commercial real estate um, uh, occupancy levels, things like that? Oh, absolutely. So one of the first steps in developing a regional transportation plan is well, you have to know where people are going to be, uh, and a lot of that is dictated upon where employment is, right? So um, kind of the very first step is we have to develop a regional demographic forecast. And so essentially what this, we take a lot of data from census, we take uh, workforce development, we take a lot of, just a lot of data, put it through sophisticated kind of computer models and, and it does, you know, a, 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 a readout or a, it's, it says that we'll have this amount of people here, you know, and this is kind of broken out by region or also by down to county level. We'll have people here, employment will be here. Um, you know, wherever that is. Um, and so what we do is, you know, we have those numbers, we, we get the, the, the output of that data. Um, and then, you know, we have a, a, on SimCog, we also work, you know, closely with, you know, a lot of kind of economic development groups and, and, and stakeholders to say, hey, we'll have these meetings, we'll have, we have this need, we have this population, we have this growth, they'll need jobs, we'll need kind of industry, um, commerce to to continue and what types of things can we do to attract industry to to southeast michigan what can we do to kind of bolster the the uh industry that we already have here in south michigan so we work closely with you know a number of different stakeholders so it's not transportation is really interrelated with a lot of uh different avenues and areas and so we work closely with with you know a large number of stakeholders across the region. You no, know, you got to you got to know uh, where where the people are going to be and where they're going to want to go before you can do a, yeah, a, a do, a, do a transit plan. Uh, we're going to take a break right now. We're talking with Chris Williams, who's planner with the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments and the Regional Transportation Plan Coordinator about what the plan is they're doing for the future. Don't go away. Uh, I'm Chuck Moss. We'll be right back here on Ion Oakland. Welcome back to Eye on Oakland. I'm Chuck Moss, hosting, and we have our guest, Chris Williams, planner with the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, or SEMCOG, and also a coordinator for the Regional Transportation Plan, which is going to uh, shape uh, how, how we get around in the metro area. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions before we uh, kind of shift gears here. We talk a lot about mobility, and mobility, uh, that's a fancy word to say how, how we do it. For years and years, it's been either cars or buses, and you know, the occasional rail, but mostly cars and buses. Um, 
is there going to be any component for anything new and new and different in the upcoming plan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've we've noticed one thing, or uh, you know, several different things. But one thing we've noticed um, as we've kind of gotten into this process and 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 in just you know in the field of transportation planning and in that number of years is that um, we have to plan or accommodate you know what the population or what the needs of the the, the region are um, and. By and large, people are driving less, or we anticipate people to drive less, or or at least on their own personal vehicles, which means that um, you may not need as much capacity on the, the roadways, which means you need other accommodations to maybe promote other modes. So whether that's uh, uh, transit, whether that's kind of non-motorized modes, so like walking or, or bicycle travel. Um, one thing that's kind of popped up over the last several years, and I'm sure you've seen them, um, if you've been, you know, anywhere in, in any downtown or the micro mobility, so like uh, the scooters or the scooters. bikes, um, things like that. So those are real, they're actually real kind of components of the transportation system or 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 vi viable modes um, that we anticipate going forward will be, you know, again, viable modes for, for folks to use to get around, um, which is a little different than, you know, like you were saying, um, the only options really being driving a personal vehicle or taking public transportation. Yeah, uh, I, scooters are, they're fun, they're cool. I mean, we did scooters, my wife and I, I remember, I remember we rode scooters in Auckland in New Zealand, but uh, mm -hmm. I can't imagine taking a scooter in, uh, in January in, in uh, Michigan. Although I, I definitely, uh, when I'm downtown, I see them around in January. I just wouldn't, ooh, it's pretty cold for me. But, uh, you know, adventurous people. So, uh, but fixed rail is always talked about because let's face it, it's cool, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but, um, aside, you know, they were talking about a fixed rail, uh, line from Ann Arbor to downtown Detroit, uh, back pre COVID, um, anything ever come of that? Um, so I think those kind of discussions, um, are ongoing, um, as far as, as far as, uh, kind of a rail system, the, the thing about um, kind of developing a, a system like is that they're very expensive, right? So um, very, sometimes very, it's very expensive. <laughs> and so, like we we always get this. So we've been doing public, we've been doing public um, comments uh, and 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 meetings about kind of what people would want to see in the transportation system, and, and we excuse me, and we all get comments about. Um, having, having, uh, uh, like a subway system or a rail system. And really at this point, I don't know if those things are really viable because of the cost. And so, um, it makes sense to maybe explore other options. So, you know, whether that is enhanced transit services, so like more headways, you know, uh, more ubiquitous routes, you know, more, more ac accessibility or whether that's maybe even new systems like bus rapid transit, which are, which are in talks um, across the region. Um, so I would, I would like to see a, 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 a rail system of some sort, you know, whether it's light rail, whether a commuter rail, subway, something like that. Um, but we have to be realistically, especially in the plan, everything has to have some identified funding in the future or reasonable expectations for identified funding, um, for funding. Um, and at this point, I'm not sure if kind of a rail system is, is, is in the cards yet. Well, the Ann Arbor, Detroit, you know, that makes sense, except for, uh, you know, it doesn't go to the airport. That's, I mean, if it doesn't go to the airport, it's like, you know, what you stop and get out and then you have to wait for a bus to the airport. Uh, yeah. A rail system that goes, it doesn't hit the airport. Okay. Uh, that was, that was a problem. Well, well, I would just say in, 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 in lieu of kind of not having that rail system that goes to the airport, um, the RTA has, uh, you know, sponsored or developed a, a couple of different services from Ann Arbor to the airport, from downtown Detroit to the airport, um, to have shuttle systems. So, you know, it, it, it isn't, you know, the, the, the exact system for like a, a rail, a rail line, uh, but, you know, there are some services that are, that are being developed with the resources that, that are currently available in the region. Well, I know that uh, uh, you know, I was on the RTA board and I was the only board member that took the bus down to the meetings, but 
I live 12 minutes away from, uh, in walking 12 minutes away from Woodward mm -hmm. and uh, Maple. So I just walk over and pick up the four, you know, the 462, you know, as easy. Uh, sure. For people who live farther out, even maybe uh, less than a mile away or up in these subdivisions, you know, what they call the last mile, that, that would be difficult. But, uh, uh, you know, it was nice having to go down and not have to worry about parking a car or anything. I liked it. I uh, you know, enjoy it. But uh, so question now is that uh, with uh, buses, transit, uh, getting people out of their cars, are you seeing more of that with the price of gas uh, up and down? It went up a lot last week. Yeah. So, you know, that's always a factor in how people travel. Right. So, you know, if it's too expensive to, to drive somewhere, you're going to have to try to explore other options. And hopefully those options are available, um, you know, over, I think, over the past few years, you know, the, the, the costs of, of, of gas uh, and, and fueling have kind of, you know, there have been some ebbs and some flows. And so, you know, you can, you know, if you were to look at travel data, you, you may see some of those, the differences in, in the cost, um, you know, who knows what the future will 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 be with you know the cost of gasoline, but ultimately the the idea is to necessarily be dependent upon kind of internal combustion engines or personal vehicles or or just one particular mode so that those costs you know they won't be as 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 pervasive as far as you know the ability for someone to get around. And then we're speaking of, uh, of rail, uh, the Q line. Remember when they started the Q line? In fact, I, I remember when the idea was floated in Lansing. I was up there. Uh, the mm -hmm. Q line, is, is, is the Q line ever going to be more than just kind of a, a fun boutique ride? Um, I th I, you know, I have, I have uh, kind of an aspirations that it will be, you know, the, the initial plans for the was, was for the Q line, you know, from what I understanding from, from some of the plans that I've saw before was a little bit different than what was kind of actually built out. And that due to a number of factors, you know, again, um, putting in a brand new rail system, um, of any type really is, is very expensive. Um, and so, um, really you kind of have to work with the resource you have, but I do know that, um, we've had several discussions, um, at SimCog with, with with the Q line and 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 their managers as far as kind of some um, ways to identify additional funding for our, you know current operations and also expansion into the future. Um, I'm hopeful that you know that system will be expanded um, along with just in general transit across the entire region. That that things will be kind of expanded and and operate a little bit more seamlessly than what um, is currently available today. Well, my problem with the Q line is it didn't come often enough or reliably enough to you know rely on it. I remember went down once to the um, to the symphony and I had a couple hours, so I took the Q line down downtown, got something to got something to eat, and I'm standing around waiting, and I realized the Q line the, the little the little car isn't going to come for another half hour, so I just said to heck with it, walked half a block, picked up a D dot bus, and took it right up. So you know I'm you know. It, it's, it's a fun thing to ride, but if you can't count on it, then you can't count sure. on it for your transportation. You mentioned regionally. Uh, Semcock has a big area. It goes all the way down to Monroe and up to Port Huron. Uh, the Gordie Howe Bridge, uh, is that going to open things up? Uh, are we going to see more intra-regional stuff because of it? Or, you know, or is Canada still is, is it still going to be you need uh, 25 passports to go to Canada? So I'm not sure if, you know, any requirements or changes as far as being a crossover uh, from, you know, the U.S. to the Canada side and then vice versa from Canada to the U.S. I do anticipate that those things change, but I do believe that there will be more capacity um, and fewer, like, slowdowns or delays uh, for anyone to cross over, um, particularly truck traffic, right? So, you know, our, our region, our economy, we're, we're, we're uh, kind of a manufacturing base. The auto industry is a major, it's essentially our critical in, in industry. Um, and that requires a lot of truck traffic. We've developed our transportation system. We have a lot of freeways. We have a lot of, you know, um, uh, freeway capacity to accommodate inter-regional inter and, you know, out of regional traffic. And so I think with the, you know, addition, additional capacity available on the Gordie Howe uh, would allow for some of that that seamless transportation to kind of occur, especially for, um, you know, our, 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 
commerce and 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 and, and economic side, um, but also for you know those who want to come over and and you know take a trip to Windsor for for you know, for dinner or for those who who are in Canada who want to come to uh, Southeast Michigan, enjoy our natural resources and just kind of all the things we have to offer. And I do think be um, a net positive for our region. Well, I do know that after all the years I've lived here, I finally decided, we decided to go see historic Fort Wayne. It's like it was historic Fort Wayne. We drove down there and that whole area is completely, being completely changed, uh, not just from the construction of the bridge, but uh, large areas for warehousing and, and transportation of goods. And so I can see the, the Gordie Howe Bridge and that being a, a major, major economic hub. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 we're we're anticipating a lot of improvements to you know how we can uh, cargo and transit in the re uh, uh, transportation in the region, truck traffic, and um, but we also have to make sure to lose sight of the implications that um, increased truck traffic may have communities uh, in Detroit and in surrounding area. But, um, you know, we're looking at at that aspect as well to make sure that with that increased you know capacity and and all the good things that come from you know the Gordy Howe being in and more capacity is that we don't lose sight that um some communities may be affected and so to make sure that those effects are you know particularly devastating to to yeah. a, one particular area true well it's all those Toronto Maple Leafs fans coming over you know you, you undesirables before we go we're gonna have to real quick if anybody wants to get involved uh in the plan I know there's public input how do they do it Sure, absolutely. Um, we've developed kind of a one-stop resource uh, for all information regarding the regional transportation plan. Um, I do want to stress that this is a, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's a living document. We have to update it every four years, which means we're quite adaptive and receptive to, you know, acute changes in the transportation system, um, even if the plan is out 25 years. So um, having said that, we value comments. We value kind of uh, any ideas about what your needs in your particular area are in the transportation system um, we value comments so we set up a uh, hub you can uh, access that hub at simcog.org slash vision 2050 so we are calling the general transportation plan vision 2050 because it has a horizon year of uh, the year 2050 so um, you can go to that that hub and provide comment you can read about um, Kind of activities that we're 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 doing for the regional transportation plan, and then we're also launching a survey um, this week, um, and you can access it at the hub as well for anyone to kind of share additional thoughts and comments about what they would want or what they think should be prioritized in the transportation system. And 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 one of the questions is actually particularly interesting. It's we have a okay, budget. We're gonna, we're gonna have problems. to run out of time here. So uh, let's go to yeah. semcog.org, S E M C O G dot org, and then Vision 2050. And that would be a great way to get in and uh, start uh, making your voice heard. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris Williams. He's a planner with uh, SEMCOG, Regional Transportation Plan Coordinator. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chuck Moss, and thank you to all of you for joining us here on Ion Oakland.